Welcome to this tutorial. I'm Peter Thompson. I've started by unzipping all the files in this set and have then opened them with my editor. I've opened index 1, noted that it links to the style sheet mystyle1.css and opened that as well. I've then opened the same file in my browser. So we have the HTML code for the file, the CSS that sets the style, and the view in the browser window. The style sheet is setting a background color to the body, which you can see here. It's setting a color for the text in the paragraph that you can see here, but no other styles are set. So we have a default style for heading 1, my document header, and also a default style for heading 2, my document content. What we need to observe here in the browser is that if I make the browser wider or narrower, the text flows to the width of the browser window. This is the default behavior for HTML and CSS code. If there's nothing to stop it happening, text will flow to fit the width. Learning about responsive design is not a passive activity. As you study, do make changes to each of the documents that we look at to make sure that you understand which component is providing the detail in the document which component is altering the color uh, we can change the color of the background by editing this we can change the color of the text by editing this uh, we need to save these and then we need to refresh our browser view and we can see our changes that we created so I added h1 text here, it appears. I added h2 text here, it appears. I changed the background color and we see the change. I've changed the color of the text and we see the change. Our next example is the file index2.html. This is linked to the style sheet mystyle2.css which contains these elements. The file, HTML file, is a little bit more complex now. We've created a navigation element, a div to hold the logo, main with a class of main content containing a number of paragraphs, a div with a class of other content, a footer containing two divs, and we can match these to the CSS. So navigation with an ID of menu. We haven't used a CSS style for navigation, but we do have one for menu. This is set to the background color of Chartreuse. The ID of logo is set to a background color of dark orange. So here we see the navigation menu in Chartreuse and the logo in dark orange. class of main content is identified here. We have a background of Azure here and clear both means that it comes below anything that's above it to the left or right. Other content has a background color of beige here 
and again clear both ensures that this under appears underneath anything already on the page. ID about here has a background color of black. The text color of antique white. And again clear both ensures it fits underneath elements above. Copyright, again we're using the ID identified here, background colour of brown, and again clear both to ensure it appears below. Now if we make the web page wider and narrower, we can see that this will still flow to fit whatever width we have in our browser. We're not restricting the behavior of the HTML to respond to whatever width, a desktop or a mobile width. The colors here are simply to help distinguish the different elements within the page. Our next example is index 3. And index 3 HTML uses the style sheet mystyle3.css and in mystyle3.css at the top we have the same styles as before but we've added a media query styles are applied from the top down anything lower down can then overwrite something that appears further up. Our media query is stating that this will operate at a minimum width of 640 pixels. At the moment our browser view is below 640 pixels so what we see are the colors set above. However Watch what happens to the menu background, the logo background, and the main content background as we increase the width of the browser window. And note the change from the wider width to the narrower width. Wider, narrower. This change is taking place at 640 pixels. So if the width is above that, these styles are now applied and they overwrite the styles set higher up in the CSS document. Index 4 has the same HTML content as before. It is now linked to mystyle4.css. Again, the greyed out CSS is the same as before, but we've made some changes to the media query. It still operates at a minimum width of 640 pixels, but to the background color of the menu we've added a float left instruction and a width of 30 percent. The logo has the same color as before, but now floats right with a width of 30% and the main con content floats left with a width of 30%. The browser is showing this in a narrow window at the moment. If we make it broader we can see the effects of these instructions to float left or float right and because the main content has got room, it's only 30%, 30%, and 30%. There's room for it to move up to go alongside the navigation. So we've now got a three column layout that is responsive to the width of the browser window. So in the wider or desktop view, we've got three columns. In a mobile view, we've got a single column. 
So we're starting to see here how we can control the responsiveness of a web page by using media queries within the CSS. In index 5, which is linked to mystyle5.css, I have added a main menu content which is an unordered list with the ID of main menu. As you can see here, we've got six options which are all links. To start with, I've got the same styles as I had in the previous example with a minimum width of 640 pixels for the media query to operate. In the narrow view we have a list of links at the top but these are too close together to use as buttons. In the broader view the media query changes this to three columns. I'm now going to add some styling to these list elements. So here we have the styling for the list. List style type being none stops it being rendered as a bulleted list. Position relative. Width 100% of the containing element. No margins or padding set here and a margin at the top of 40 pixels. Each list item displays as an inline block with a margin at its bottom of 4 pixels. This makes a visible gap between the menu items. Width of 100%. Background color is still set to chartreuse. Border style, so a solid border around it, and the border width is one pixel. Let's just refresh our browser to see the effect of doing this. Uh, I need to save it first and then refresh the browser. So here we see that we've no longer got the bullet points on the list items. Each item sits in a box the anchor the link within the list is now display block with a height of 40 pixels a line height of 40 pixels and this is to make the clickable area the full size of the box that surrounds the link now this is very useful for mobile devices that are touch sensitive. So simply touching this means that we've created a button that can use that link. Text overflow, ellipsis. This means if our text is too long to fit in, um, then we'll get dots, three dots, instead of the rest of the text. This keeps everything uh, much, much neater with the overflow actually being hidden. If we hover over the link, it should change to yellow. And there we see that in action. So it's obvious which link we're selecting with a mouse. And we can click those as buttons. Now if we see what happens now when we make it wider. The menus now move to the side. We've still got the links operating as buttons, but they're now within a three column layout. And if we look at the text here, we could do with some uh, padding between the elements, but we haven't added that at this stage. Index six demonstrates how to create submenus the HTML code has added 
further unordered lists within lists. So here is one unordered list within a list. And within that we have another unordered list with three items. This is styled here. So a list that contains an unordered list, the unordered list is styled here and we've set it to display none. The anchor with the unordered list, when you hover over it, contained within a list, we give it a color, azure. This controls what happens if you hover over an item. It is then displayed in line with a relative position. So if we go to our list, you can see that we've got the heading there, multiple options one, which is the heading here, multiple options one, and the heading here, multiple options four, which is this heading here, both of which contain sublists. If I now hover over those, they are expanded and we see the sub-options. And we can repeat this process. So hovering over that link gives further sub-options. You may notice that we've changed the color of the hover action here. So this is how we can build up lists with sublists. We don't want a long menu occupying the space on a mobile device all the time. So if this was visible all the time, it wouldn't leave much room for anything else. So what we want to do is to have a button which can be used to show and hide the menu. So there's the menu hidden, there's the menu displayed. And usually we would start with the menu hidden with just the button visible. This is all created with HTML and CSS. No JavaScript is needed. The HTML has a label for a checkbox. So it's label for show menu and the checkbox has an ID of show menu. So when you click on the label, you check the checkbox. But the checkbox we leave hidden. So this has an ID of show menu and we use display none. So this hides the checkbox so that the user can't see it. We then look to see the state of show menu, the checkbox, and if it's checked, we apply the style display block to the menu. Otherwise, it's display none. So when we start display none, when it's checked, display block and it will toggle between the two. Display menu, class display menu. Again, displaying as a block, floating left, 45% width. Um, this color is going to be white for the text with a background of sky blue. So here's our button, white text, sky blue background padding of 10 pixels. So a label that identifies a checkbox. The checkbox is display none, so hidden. When it's checked, the menu is displayed. So that allows us to create a button that will display the menu when we want it, 
and hide the menu otherwise. Click and click again. Our next example is still the same on a narrower screen. But if we want to create a menu across the top when the screen is wider, we can do this within a media query. Our menu is still the same as in the previous example. The rest of the CSS is still the same as the previous example. But we've added some code to the media query. The media query will overwrite the style set higher up in the style sheet. So now we've got our unordered list to have a margin top of zero. And we can use calc to do sums within CSS. So we're going to split the screen into seven parts. We're going to use 96% of the width and divide it by seven. Each item, we're going to have a margin right of two pixels to give space between the elements. And again, we're going to use our calculation of 96% divided by seven. So that's going to divide it into seven equal widths with a room each side for the two pixel spacing. And we're going to float it left. The menu display, the button, we no longer need. So that is set to display none. So on a screen that's 640 pixels wide or higher, we have a menu along the top. If we go back to a narrower screen, we go back to the menu suitable for the mobile device. Images can also be made responsive. On our web page, we have got two similar images, but they're being placed on the page in slightly different ways. We're using the style for the image to give a max width of 100%, which will ensure that they don't expand beyond the size of the image and become pixelated, and height of auto. The top image uses a fairly standard way of placing an image on the page. It sits within a figure class and it has alternative text. The figure class, the figure includes a figure caption and this is standard HTML5 for images. The second method is to only download an image that suits the width available on the page. In this example, we're placing images of different sizes in different folders. So we've got an image that's 960 pixels wide that sits in a subfolder that is also labeled 960. The next one has a minimum width of 640 pixels and the same image in its own folder and a minimum width of 320 pixels. We have the same image in small folder. So these are the same image source, but they have been processed to make them different sizes. And again, the image sits within a figure with a figure caption. So this is the figure caption here. Now watch what happens in the browser window as I make the browser narrower. This upper image is the single large image 
adjusting to fit the width of the window. The lower image has now switched to the smaller image and as we continue to make it narrower it would switch to the smallest image. This is particularly useful for mobile devices when they first load an image. In this second case, this thumbnail will only be loaded as the small image, the smallest image. In the top case, this will be loading a large image but making it appear much smaller. So using the source media for the picture makes this much more efficient in memory for a mobile device. So we have a responsive image and we're only downloading the size of image that we need. But the end result for the user is a nice image at whatever width of screen.